Welcome to the London Luminaries Lecture Series. It's lovely to see you here and thank you for being part of this lecture series, which celebrates 12 historic organisations working together collaboratively to celebrate our local heritage. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for this evening. Great delight that I get the opportunity to introduce our amazing chair this evening. She's a broadcaster, a lecturer and a historian. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel, for that welcome. And I want to thank also Chris, but also to Robert, Angela and Ricky. Let's turn our attention now back to Twickenham and the Thames and the Luminaries. Uh, this series, as you might know, builds on previous series. This is the third that we've done on our incredibly rich area in southwest London. And you can find recordings of those previous lectures on the Marble Hill House YouTube channel. This recording will go up there afterwards as well, but without the Q&A. Now, why have we made so much fuss about our neighbourhood? Well, it's because this area of the River Thames was a magnet for creative and influential people, especially during the 18th century, due to its proximity to London, which was becoming the centre of a growing empire. The riverfront from Hampton to Richmond attracted royalty, aristocrats, artists, writers, and wealthy property owners. And the legacy of these luminaries was a rich tapestry of connections of poets, painters, politicians, and princes that made the area the place to be. And it, in some ways it still is. We'll be exploring these treasures further in a talk about what we call Twickenham Shire in a, a talk that's part of the Richmond Literary Festival. And that takes place on the 11th of November and details can either be found on the Richmond Literary Festival webpage or our own Luminaries webpage. Let me now welcome tonight's speaker. And I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome Nadej because I've had a, a, a view of her talk in advance and it is really amazing. Our speaker, Nadej Ford Vidal, is a London based historian and archaeologist. She has been exploring the Black presence in 18th century London for over three years, using maps, parish records, archives, and the University of Glasgow's Runaway Slaves in Britain database. She's developing a school's local history resource that maps and expands on the lives of nearly 800 African and Asian people who lived in London between 1700 and 1789. Nadej currently leads a team of volunteer researchers at Chiswick House and Gardens investigating the lives of the Black employees who lived and worked on site, as well as the influential Black figures reflected in the historic collection. Today she'll be sharing some of that research with us, so I hand over now to Nadej. Hello and uh, thank you very much Judith for the wonderful introduction. It's really exciting to be here and lovely to see so many people coming together to support our local heritage sites. Choosing a topic for today really wasn't very easy. Chiswick had so much diverse history, but with the start of our Black Chiswick Through History project a few months ago, we thought this was an ideal opportunity to share some of our recent work, which builds a great deal on work already started by Dr. Hewlings in uh, 2004, and also expands a little on Dr. Miranda Kaufman's 2007 report for English Heritage. When I saw this year's theme and the word prince, I was reminded straight away of a book I read in 2018 called Black London, written by Gretchen Gerziner. Her research really kick-started the work that I've been doing on historical black presence in London. The first chapter of Gretchen's book is called Paupers and Princes, repainting the picture of 18th century England. And in it, she says this, once the lens through which we view the 18th century is refocused, the London of Johnson, Reynolds, Hogarth and Pope, that elegant, feisty, intellectual and earthy place of neoclassicism and city chaos becomes occupied by a parallel world of Africans and their descendants working and living alongside the English. They answer their doors, run their errands, carry their purchases, wear their livery, appear in their law courts, play their music, write in their newspapers and appear in their novels, poems and plays, they sit for portraits, appear in caricatures, and marry their servants. They also have private lives, baptise their children, attend schools, bury their dead. They are everywhere, as familiar a sight to Shakespeare as they were to Garrick, and almost as familiar to both as they are to Londoners today. So, inspired once again by 
Gretchen's words, today I'll be refocusing the lens to explore the private lives of the African and Asian men, women and children connected to Chiswick House and Gardens in the 18th century. I'll be demonstrating how we can piece together details of their lives through a study of what their owners and employers wrote. In this case, the personal letters of Dorothy and Richard Boyle, otherwise known as Lord and Lady Burlington, and Georgiana Cavendish, the Duchess of Devonshire. And how we can flesh out these narratives with information in household accounts, parish records, naval documents, and newspaper adverts. But before we start, it's essential to put these displaced lives into their wider context. And also to mention that individuals described as black in the records of the period come from a broad geographical spectrum, including Africa, India, and China, as we'll see. And even when this specific detail is provided, its accuracy is often debatable. So it's usually very hard to prove in any specific individual ethnicity. Commonly, historians acknowledge a continuous black presence in Britain since the mid to late 1500s, when a trend for black servants and entertainers began to filter down from the royal court to less wealthy households. The black population grew consistently once Britain became firmly ensconced in the triangular trade in enslaved labour and the development of the colonial plantation. Naval captains, planters and politicians frequently returned from abroad with enslaved servants. Evidence for this is ample, like this advert, seeking the capture and return of a 12 year old boy, the property of one Jonas Hanway, captain of HMS the Tilbury from which the boy ran. So Jonas Hanway was well known to Lady Burlington. They both helped to co-found the Foundling Hospital. Black children of African and Asian origin were bought in the coffee houses alongside the Strand, Cornhill and Lombard Street. For sale adverts reveal preferred characteristics. Boys and girls with very dark complexions were particularly prized. Their blackness highlighted the owner's pale complexion at a time when white skin was perceived as a sign of purity and beauty. Many of these children were brought to Britain by merchant Navy captains who were permitted a quota of individuals per voyage as their own. By 1768, Granville Sharp put the number of black servants alone, a figure which included many people of Asian origin, in London at 20,000. Many today would see this as an exaggeration. Add to this transient individuals though, those that come and go like the sailors, soldiers and musicians and the students, which we don't hear much about. Christopher Fife, for example, in 1789, estimated that there were 50 male and 28 female students in London, Bristol, Lancaster and Liverpool from Sierra Leone alone. And many others came from the West Indies including the mixed heritage children of plantation owners. In the mid 1780s, over a thousand enslaved Africans who had risked everything to fight for the British during the American War of Independence, laid their claim to the freedom promised to them and made their way to Britain. The numbers of free black residents in Britain logically increased. Skilled craftsmen, businessmen, property owners, like Cesar Picton seen here in the middle, a successful coal merchant from Kingston on Thames. So too did the number of politically and culturally influential figures like activist and author Ottobar Coguanu, George Pridgetown, the concert violinist and friend of Beethoven, Ignatius Sancho, the composer and playwright and a close friend of Garrick, representing just a fraction. Many more of these success stories lie dormant in the archives. From the middle of the 18th century, if not earlier, a very effective black community existed, particularly in London and the other major ports. They had joint concerns and unsurprising sense of solidarity, despite vast geographical and cultural differences and an effective communication network. There were black clubs, churches, meeting places. Far from the isolationist view often presented, this was a thriving and structured community that also functioned as a network of resistance. We can see this in the adverts in the newspapers for runaways. They frequently refer to the assistance of companions or claim that people were deluded and coerced away. And the archives make specific references to safe houses. One called Jerusalem was located in the East End. What's clear is that individual experience and legal status varied enormously, ranging from those who were free and lived comfortably to those who were displayed as walking accessories in copper, brass and silver collars 
a fashion that supported a whole industry of metal workers, engravers and jewellers. Many feared being forced into an early demise on the plantations once they outgrew their usefulness as young pages. This looming threat had indeterminable effects on the mental health and well-being of those who had already experienced unimaginable horrors. A number of runaway adverts refer to individuals with speech issues described as stutters, recognised now as a clear symptom of PTSD. So with all this in mind, let's take a look at the first letter written on October the 11th, 1728, by Lady Burlington to her husband. They were an extremely eligible pair when they married in 1721. Dorothy, near Savile, was intelligent and empathetic, one of the original subscribers to Torres Coram's founding hospital for abandoned babies. But she too was also to be accounted among the numerous aristocrats that were seen around town with their black pages and footmen. In this family portrait painted by Van Luce in 1739, we can just make out a young black boy standing behind Dorothy's chair. His age is difficult to pinpoint, though he appears to be prepubescent. But the portrait also includes Dorothy's daughter, who had passed away some years before, so we can't assume that his is a truthful portrayal either. Neither can we say who he is for sure, as there are now several possible candidates, as we shall see. Dorothy writes this letter from Windsor, where, as Lady of the Bedchamber, she's in service to Queen Caroline. The section we are interested in reads as follows. This will be a day of great hurry, and therefore I write this morning, but expect every minute to be called on. I've had a bad racket with the footman. Will and Cassar quarrelled, and the former would not stay, so Ferret has discharged him. And I sent James to borrow Frank until he can get another, which he has now done. It seems Will wanted to go before I came hither, which I never knew, and the chief reason he gives is that the rest of the servants turn him into drink and tease him, and they tell me that the real truth is he's afraid of being taken up. As to Cassar, he is so idle and drunken, and Ferret says so impertinent, that you must think of disposing of him some other way, for if he's put away, he must either steal or starve, for nobody will take him. I therefore think the best way would be to let him to have running with the rest of ye cattle at Lonsborough, and Ferret tells me that who is with you is much ye worse to be said. There's a lot of interesting information provided about at least five different servants in this letter. We can identify John Ferret as the butler in charge of the servants, a woman called Jane who appears to be a housekeeper. James could be James Cambridge, who we know to be black from household accounts, and we discover that Dorothy's footmen have accompanied her to the Queen's household, one of whom is also known to be black, Joseph Cassar, because his baptism is recorded on the 27th of July, 1725, at St Nicholas's Church in Chiswick. His name, unlikely to be the one his mother gave him, could be a misspelling of Caesar, a commonly imposed alias, but Cassar is also Spanish and may provide a clue as to his route to Britain and potential homeland. Though we do not know how old Joseph was in 1725, he was not a baby. Baptism was common for the black servants of the aristocracy who saw themselves as civilising agents of God. The Burlingtons also sought to baptise a Richard Tamerlane at St Nicholas in 1726 and an unnamed black man baptised in St James on the 21st of March 1730 was presumably employed at Burlington House. Unlike in the colonies, in Britain, the Church of England was not prohibitive. Once here, many sought to join congregations officially. It provided access to a certain degree of financial assistance, if required, for those settled in a parish, but was also a legal prerequisite for marriage and a proper burial. Baptism was also seen as a pathway to freedom by many in the colonies and here in Britain. In 1768, for example, a David Spence brought from the West Indies to Scotland claimed that since he had been baptised, he was no longer a heathen and therefore no longer a slave. The description provided of Joseph by Dorothy and her butler in the letter of 1728 appears to cast him in a fairly bad light at first glance. But if we refocus our lens, as Gretchen suggests, these are characteristic signs of active resistance. Joseph's idleness is a physical manifestation of his refusal to engage in enforced labour, whether paid or not. His drunkenness, a well-known symptom of depression, and his impertinent and understandable reaction to his circumstances and past experiences. 
household accounts relating to payments made to staff at Burlington House and Chiswick in the same year by Henry Simpson demonstrate that Joseph was paid for his services and travelled across the country incurring expenses that he was expected to record, indicating he could both read and write to some degree. The phrase put away seems to imply letting him go, and Dorothy acknowledges Joseph's vulnerability to poverty. He must steal or starve, she says. So her solution is to ask Lord Burlington to find him a different role. The suggestion she makes is interesting, that he be sent to run cattle at Lonsborough, maybe indicating that also a black presence on the Burlington estates in Yorkshire. More research in this area will hopefully follow. Lord Burlington's response to Dorothy's letter gives us a clue as to what happens next, though we cannot be entirely sure as it refers to Joseph as Jack, which is a common shorthand, but could also refer to James. In it, Lord B advises that Jack be put out rather than away, and he vocalises a strong moral obligation to protect him by keeping him employed in some capacity. Rather than abandoning him to an uncertain and potentially impoverished future, the implication is that he will be given a role on the estate which keeps him away from the house, polite society and further altercations. Whether at Chiswick or at Lonsborough, we do not know. But accounts suggest he continued to be paid by Simpson well into 1729. Hopefully the archives at Chatsworth will allow us to piece together more of Joseph's life. An undated letter from Dorothy, recently uncovered by our volunteers at the British Library, may be the reply to Lord Burlington. It mentions a Jack in relation to a Lady Albemarle, who may have been asked to take him on in some capacity. This is another trail we are yet to follow. Before we move on to the next letter, I just wanted to briefly discuss the other footman involved in the altercation, Will, who also appears to have an issue with alcohol alongside a fear of being taken up that only the other servants were aware of. It's possible that Will's anxiety is caused by the lingering threat of being sent to the plantations, indicating that perhaps he too is black. His decision to leave the Burlington's employ is interesting. It confirms he has choice and can opt to take his own chances in life. Without a full name, albeit potentially not his own, it becomes much harder to find the clues in the archive needed to reconstruct what Rebecca Hall describes as the shape of his absence. The next letter we're going to look at is also written by Dorothy Boyle, but over a decade later. Dated to Friday the 3rd of July, initially thought to be year 1730, we've been able to ascertain that this was actually dated to 1739. The same year the Van Noos portrait we looked at earlier was completed and hung at Lonsborough. In the letter, Dorothy says to her husband, I'm offered a black girl of three months old. It belongs to one of Mrs. Franklin's black women who came over with her, who was unluckily with child on shipboard and they are going to be sent back. If she, this section is somewhat unclear, what to do with it? I think would be charity to save you child from going back. Pray tell me your opinion. To find out a little bit more about this baby and her mother, we focused on the Franklins, who they might be, where they might have recently returned from. A close connection between the Burlingtons and the Franklins was instantly apparent. Thomas Franklin, second baronet, was MP for Thirsk in Yorkshire, but more importantly, he and his family became the Burlington's neighbours when Thomas inherited Sutton Court in 1713. Lord Burlington bought Sutton Court from the Franklins in 1728, absorbing a considerable part of their already well-developed landscape gardens into the Chiswick estate. The rest Lord Burlington bequeathed to William Murray, aka Lord Mansfield, in 1754. But which Mrs Franklin does the letter refer to? Thomas's wife, Elizabeth, who resided at Sutton Court, had already passed by July 1739. But there are other possibilities and many yet to investigate. Like Dinah, first wife of Thomas III Baronet, who died in 1741. So far, though we can find no clear connection, direct connection that is, to the colonies, her husband was on the Board of Trade and the Lord of the Admiralty. Or it could be Mary, near Cross, daughter of the merchant Alexander Cross and wife of Thomas's brother, Henry. Mary was stationed with Henry, who was governor of Bengal for the East India Company at Fort William until her husband's death in 1738. As the letter dates to 1739, 
Is it possible that the black woman and child referred to in a letter returned with Mary from Fort William? Mary's son, Thomas, <clears throat> the fifth baronet, was serving on HMS Chatham in 1739. Ship's logs will be able to tell us more about his travels and activities, but we know that from the 1740s, Thomas was promoted to captain of HMS Rose and had become a notorious privateer and prolific slave trader, taking thousands of human prizes from Spanish ships. He developed close connections with the Bahamas and Antigua and was known as a stubborn and ill-tempered man, quick to quarrel with his colleagues and superiors, none of which seems to have hindered him from becoming MP for Thirsk between 1747 and 1780 and having the Franklin Islands near Queensland named after him. Mary's other son, Charles, was also in the Americas and by 1741 was serving as collector of the Port of Boston. It would not be unusual then for Mary, who died at a ripe old age in 1783, to return from visiting her family with any number of enslaved servants over the years. More research into this could prove very fruitful. It's decidedly possible that both mother and child would have been residing in the Franklin family home in George Street, Hanover Square, shown here on John Rock's map of 1746, located right next to the Burlington estate, which you can see top right. The mother mentioned in the letter must have been nursing her baby whilst awaiting these decisions to be made beyond her control that would have had a huge impact on the future of her child. Remaining with her daughter does not seem to have been an option. We can see from parish records that there is already a significant number of black people living and working in the vicinity. The local church mentions here several baptisms, but there are also marriage barns and burials. How should we interpret the language used, which appears both practical and emotive? Dorothy sees saving this child, not the mother, as an act of charity rather than her moral duty. Is she led by a degree of understanding about the treatment of young black girls in the colonies? Let's not forget that Dorothy had already lost two daughters by 1739 and outlived all of her children eventually. How did she reconcile her loss with that about to be experienced by this black mother? We wonder what the mother's reaction would have been. Would she have asked to remain with her child? Would she have been listened to? Was the father known? Was this an issue? Might she even have been forcefully separated from her children before? As this slide shows, this was still very much common practice all the way through to the 1860s. With no choice but to return without her child, she would have been left with nothing but a tenuous hope that her daughter would grow up safe and free on British soil, whilst being acutely aware of the fact that the sale of black children was common in the London coffee houses. Of course, as this slide demonstrates, there's also the possibility that the mother, like many others like her, elected to run away before the ship left port. Here we have an advert seeking the capture and return of a young woman called Sabina, who ran from the ship Hannah, which was bound from Jamaica. And what about the little girl? Did Dorothy take her into her own care or did she make provision for her elsewhere? Household accounts may prove enlightening. Plans were already afoot in 1739, but the founding hospital did not open its doors to its first children until 1741. But this doesn't mean that Dorothy didn't have a network of similar minded ladies who could be resourceful when needed. As we can see, the archives often pose far more questions than they provide answers. So looking forward, what happens later on in the 18th century? Were there black people at Chiswick during the Devonshire residency? Various visual and textual references demonstrate a black presence in the Devonshire household well before they inherited Chiswick and potentially upon Dorothy's death in 1758 may well have absorbed her staff into their own. This document suggests that this presence dates back to at least the 1660s. So here we have a document which uh, was created on uh, behalf of a woman called Margaret, the widow of Robert Janando, who was born in Guinea in 1657 and joined the Devonshire household in around 1663 at the age of six, presumably as a page. Um, so he would have lived and worked at the old Devonshire house in Bloomsbury and then moved to what was later renamed the new Devonshire house at Berkeley House. Um, so he and Margaret were married um, 
when he was around 19 and he passed away in 1716. So he would have served both first and sec second Dukes of Devonshire. This is a portrait of the second Duke of Devonshire, one we're quite familiar with by now, um, which also demonstrates obviously that this black presence continues into the early 1700s, young African boy on the right hand side. So Robert, who's mentioned in the document beforehand, would have been in his 50s when this was painted and presumably would have lived and interacted with this um, as yet unidentified young black African boy. Moving on now to a letter written by Georgina Cavendish, the Duchess of, De of Devonshire, to her mother, Lady Margaret Spencer. This gives us a real insight into how many of these African and Asian children arrived in Britain. The letter dates to March 17th, 1784. Georgina writes, Dear Mama, George Hanger has sent me a black boy, 11 years old and very honest, but the Duke don't like me having a black, and yet I cannot bear the poor wretch being ill-used. If you like him instead of Michel, I will send him. He will be a cheap servant and you will make a Christian of him and a good boy, perhaps a Sancho. If you don't like him, they say Lady Rockingham wants one and Mr. Crewe, but I own my conscience would be easier if you would have him. George Hanger, seen here, AKA Lord Coleraine, had just returned from the American War of Independence. Often the subject of caricature, as you can see, he sent Georgina an 11 year old black boy whose name we are not provided with. We know it was not uncommon for naval captains and aristocrats to acquire enslaved children for a number of purposes whilst overseas and to give them away as gifts on their return. So where might Lord Coleraine have met this young boy? George's diary confirms he fell seriously ill and was recovering on board the Pearl as it spent three months sailing around the Caribbean. The young boy may have been accompanied George for some time or perhaps captured from a prize ship or brought on board from any number of ports to assist the crew or George's recovery. The diaries include too many potential locations to explore them all fully, but an examination of the ship's logbook might uncover more details of the crew on board the Pearl and the personal servants of the officers. If the boy was caring for George prior to embarkation, it's possible he joined him in Charlestown at the bequest of the physician, Dr. Hayes. Wherever and whenever the two met, the young boy became the property of Lord Coleraine, though it appears he was no longer needed once back in Britain. It's also interesting that Georgiana refers to the Duke as not liking her having a black, though whether this refers to ethnicity or status is very hard to tell. What we can say is that the 1780s saw a significant rise in pro-abolition support, perhaps impacting on the Duke's choice of household. Does Georgina's comment mean that there were no black employees at all, or that there were no unfree black employees at the time the letter was written? It would appear to be the latter, as documents confirm at least three skilled local black men employed by the Devonshires, both at Chiswick and Devonshire House. Recent research by Dr. Hannah Wallace appears to suggest that Georgina's hairdresser and milliner for over a decade, the creator of her elaborate coiffure and gigantic hats, was black, perhaps born in Paris, as were two tailors, perhaps a father and son, found in the Chatsworth Servants database, whom we will discuss in more detail shortly. Georgina, like Dorothy before her, clearly recognises the child's vulnerability. She uses language like wretch, ill-used and honest, and appears determined to provide him with a good Christian home, which she clearly believes her mother is best suited to provide. She even states that her mother could make him another Sancho. Does she mean Ignatius Sancho, whom we discussed earlier? Did he become an accomplished composer? Little consideration is shown for poor Michel, on the other hand, whose security and comfort may well be about to come to a swift end. The response to Georgina's mother sent to this letter and the household accounts might help us to determine if the boy did, give, did go to live with Margaret. If so, he would have spent his time divided between Spencer House, seen here in the 1800s, in St. James, just around the corner from Devonshire and Burlington House, and Althorpe Hall in Northamptonshire, where he would have probably been baptized like Caesar Shaw in 1732. Seen here, with John, Georgina's father, who passed away just three months after Georgina's first child was born in 1783. 
I'd like to end today's lecture, which I'm sure you can all appreciate, merely scratches the surface by mentioning two individuals that I came across very recently in the Chatsworth Servants database and would really like to explore further. I believe these two men represent free, black, skilled people living in Chiswick, working for the Devonshires, at the same time as Jean-Baptiste Gilbert, Georgina's hairdresser, and owning property next to that of the Fifth Duke. Edward Blackmore and William Blackmore worked at Devonshire House and Chiswick between the late 1750s and 1780s. The name makes them stand out, derived as it is from Blackamoor, a common surname from Tudor times adopted by or imposed upon Britain's black residents. These Blackmoors are both skilled craftsmen. William is a children's tailor between 1759 and 64 at Devonshire House, presumably dressing the future fifth duke who would have been 11, and Edward, a tailor at Chiswick House between 1782 and three, potentially continuing to dress the duke 20 years later. I hadn't considered any particular connection between the two men until I discovered a baptism record for Edward Blackmore in 1755, the son of William and Anne, in St James, the parish that served both Devonshire and Burlington House. There's a document here also that you can see demonstrates on the right hand side an indenture signed, um, which is a, effectively an apprenticeship between an Edward Blackmore and a local London tailor uh, in the mid 1600s. Who knows, this may well be a relative. Parish records also show that an Edward Blackmore married Dorothy Trimmin in Chiswick in 1779. And also a document uh, 1851 census seen here in the middle shows that a Dorothy Blackmore daughter of Edward and Dorothy was born in 1785 in Covent Garden. Now we know that both Edward and William were working together in Henrietta Street, Covent Garden, which was a popular location for fashion and tailoring and millinery. And as you can see from the 1788 census below, where each individual residing in and around Henrietta Street is related to fashion, woolen drapers, upholsterers, etc. Now, there are so many more avenues for us to explore, really flesh out all of these histories that I've introduced you to. I hope that by refocusing the lens slightly on the different type of private lives that occur at Chiswick House and these individuals, these forgotten men, women and children of colour, we can carry on widening the scope of these narratives and the way that we present to the public at Chiswick House and Gardens, both physically and digitally well into the future and I hope you've enjoyed listening. Thank you. I wanted to thank Nadej and I'm going to open to questions and give her a proper thanks in, in just a moment. But first of all, I want to draw uh, the rest of your attention to two more talks that we have coming up next week about Pitzhanger and Pope's Grotto. And then next calendar year in January and February, we have another series. If you want to support the work that Nadej has been undertaking at Chiswick House and also the other amazing things that happen at Chiswick House and Garden, do check out their website, see how you can donate there. If you want to take part more directly, if you want to volunteer to, um, to work in any way at Chiswick House, do please um, follow the links on their website to how you can support them too. That was an incredibly rich and informative talk about the, the way in which black people feature in, in so many ways in, in British life. I mean, there has been a continuous black presence to at least since at least the time of the Romans in Britain, and you, you demonstrate very ably how it becomes increasingly important from the Tudor era onwards. So it's, there, are, there are many black people living in Britain who, are, who predate chattel slavery and plantation slavery. So that's extraordinarily rich 